Veronique van Vlasselaar received a master's degree, magna cum laude, in business economics, option information systems engineering from KU Leuven in Belgium. For her master thesis topic, entitled Mining Data on Twitter, she received the best thesis award from the faculty's student branch. In October 2012, Veronique started as a PhD researcher in the data mining apps group at the Department of Decision Sciences and Information Management at KU Leuven. Her main research topics include social network analysis, fraud detection, and net lift modeling. In her video session, Veronique will talk about using social networks for fraud detection at the Belgian Social Security Service. Hi, my name is Veronique van Vlasser and I'm a PhD researcher uh, with the Department of Decision Sciences and Information Management uh, of the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium. And today I want to present you how you can improve traditional fraud detection techniques with social network analytics. Now for those of you who already are familiar with fraud detection techniques, you know that it's often hard to effectively determine which cases, for example, which persons will commit fraud in the near future. And most of the time we have the feeling that there's something missing. And maybe this ingredient that is missing is the relationships between people. For example, people commit fraud just because they know that other people are also committing fraud. And maybe those people know other people who are committing fraud. And as such, there is a small subgraph developing in a huge network where there is some kind of shared knowledge of how fraud can be committed. And this is the goal of the presentation. How can we include such information in traditional fraud detection techniques? Now, this is the outline of the presentation. I will start with introducing the problems of fraud detection. What are the challenges and how can we solve them? What is social network analytics? Um, how should we represent the network? And can we use uh, social, network analysis, um, social network analysis for um, fraud detection? And which features can we extract from networks? In the third section, we will focus on how fraud propagates through the network. Because maybe, it's, uh, maybe fraud is some kind like a virus going through the network and uh, affecting each node on its path. And in the, third, for in the fourth uh, section, I will um, introduce you to a case study. Um, more specifically, the social, security, uh, in, uh, the social Security Institution for the Belgian government. They have some fraud detection tools and it appears that it's very useful to integrate social knowledge in these traditional fraud detection tools. And of course, I will end my presentation with a conclusion. So, how do we define fraud? For me, fraud is an uncommon, well-considered, imperceptibly concealed, time-evolving and often carefully organized crime which appears in many types and forms. Now, these are five characteristics. It's uncommon, it's well-considered, it's imperceptibly concealed, it's time-evolving and it's carefully organized. And these five characteristics are challenges that need to be solved before fraud detection techniques can be efficient. Now, what do we mean with uncommon? Uncommon means that in most of the fraud detection problems, the number of fraud cases in the data set is very small compared to the total number of cases. And most of the time, it's less than 1%. If we give this data set to a model, the model will just classify all instances as non-fraudulent. The model has a high performance because um, it has an uh, accuracy of more than 99% and an error rate of less than 1%, but the, um, the, the, the model is not doing what we want it to do. Therefore, we propose SMOOT. We have to rebalance the data set. SMOOT is a technique that consists of two phases. In the first phase, we're going to undersample the majority class. In fraud detection, that means that we are going to reduce the number of legitimate cases. 
How can we understand? Well, we can just select randomly cases from the legitimate class. On the other hand, in the second phase of SMOOT, we will oversample the minority class. And oversampling the minority class uh, can be done in two possible ways. First, we can duplicate fraud cases. Second, we can create artificial fraud cases. For example, by taking the mean of two existing fraud cases. And as such, we can rebalance the data set and we can show the model that um, it should emphasize fraud, that it should distinguish between fraud and non-fraud. Second characteristic, it's well considered. Fraud is not something fraudsters des decide to do now. No, there is a whole process before they actually gonna commit fraud. Now, I agree, um, information of one year ago or information of five, year ago, five years ago, it's not equally important. Uh, the, more, the, uh, the more recent the data is, the more important. So we should assign a higher weight to more recent data. That's why we use uh, the concept temporal weighting. Fraud is imperceptibly concealed, meaning that it's difficult to identify in a network or in a data set. And that's why I suggest if there are experts, um, ask them what they think about fraud. What are they, their expectations about fraud? Use their expert knowledge to create features. A fourth characteristic it's, is that it's time evolving. Meaning that fraud today is not the same as fraud tomorrow. Um, a model should work on year one, but it should also work on year two and year three and year four. And it should incorporate changes in the environment. On the other hand, we should also distinguish um, in what time window the model should be able to detect fraud. Is it on short term, or is it on medium term, or is it on long term? And then the last characteristic, it's carefully organized. As I already said, fraud is often not an individual phenomenon, but there are many uh, interactions between fraudsters, and there is um, a subnetwork, a fraud and subnetwork, um, developing in a big network. How can we detect that? Well, we can use social network analysis to do that. What is social network analysis? Many people think social network analysis is just like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. But it goes far beyond that. All kinds of transactional data where two objects are related to each other implicitly or explicitly can make a network, can create a network. For example, um, for example, for explicit links, people calling to each other, or fraudsters related to a crime, or people wiring money to each other. These are implicit links, but also, these are explicit links, but also implicit links, like people who review the same products or the same websites, people who visit the same, um, uh, who, who visit the same websites, um, people who take the same path between work and home, who take the same bus, who take the same train. These are all implicit links. Now, if you have transactional data, how can we represent it as a network? Well, a network consists of two items. First of all, there are nodes or vertices. These are the points in the network. These points can represent persons or criminals or a crime or a location or a company. And we can assign a weight to each point. And a weight can, for example, represent the magnitude of the crime or can just say, well, this person is a fraudulent person and that other person is a legitimate person. On the other hand, we have edges or lines. These are the links connecting two nodes. And for example, a link 
can an edge or a link can represent whether a person is involved in a crime, can relate a crime to a person. But a link can also um, identify friend friendship relations between two persons. Now again, this link can have a weight. For example, what is the strength of involvement in a certain crime? Or what is the intensity of the friendship relation? When, uh, when you have constructed such networks, you will see that these networks often are very, very large. And it's often not scalable to, um, to extract features from such a large network. That's why we will focus on a neighborhood of a node. What is a neighborhood? Well, a neighborhood is a subgraph of the network centered around a node of interest. And we can make the distinc uh, distinction in, uh, uh, between the first order network, for example, the um, direct associates of a node, or the n order network, all the associates of that node that can be reached in at most n hops. Second thing, when you, re uh, when you make your network, you should carefully think about how you will represent network structure. For example, um, on this slide, we have only one type of nodes. Let's assume that these nodes represent companies. And white circles are legitimate companies and black circles are fraudulent companies. Now these companies, these, uh, these are related to each other in terms of resources. For example, when they uh, share the same address or when they share some equipment or employees or suppliers and buyers. When they do, when they share something, when they share a resource, there is a link. What can this link represent? Well, first it can be a binary link, just saying, yes, there is a shared resource between these two companies. On the other hand, it can be an absolute value link, um, stating that, yes, there are five shared resources between companies. Or it can be a relative value link, Yes, 20% of uh, the resources is shared between those companies. Now this is a visual representation and it's often difficult to work with. That's why it should be mapped to a matrix. And that matrix um, has C rows and C columns, which C the number of companies in our network. And the entry in, the in and each entry in the matrix is either zero when there is no link between companies, or it is um, unequal to zero, meaning that there is some link. And the higher the value of um, the entry, the higher the weight between two companies. Now, this is a very simple representation. What if we want to include additional information, like, for example, the resources? Then we include two types of uh, nodes. The circles are again the companies. White circles are legitimate companies, black circles are fraudulent companies. But this time we include resources and these are the diamonds. White di diamonds are legitimate resources, black diamonds are fraudulent resources. Now this gives a more detailed overview um, and if you want to represent this as a matrix, we will create a matrix with C rows and R columns, with C the number of companies and R the number of resources. Now, is this actually a better representation? Well, let's prove it. So the left network is a unipartite network. So that means that there is only one uh, type of nodes. The right network is a bipartite network, meaning that there are two types of nodes. Now, if one wants to know which company is the most fraudulent one or which company has the highest probability to be fraudulent in the next period, and we have to choose between company A, uh, company one and company two, what will our answer be? Uh, what will our answer be? Well, if we focus on the left network, we can see that company one is related to two legitimate companies and two fraudulent companies. The same 
um, is for company two. Company two is related to two legitimate companies and two fraudulent companies. So based on, uh, upon this network representation, I cannot tell which company will be the most fraudulent one. On the other hand, if we look to the bipartite graph, and we look to company one, we can see that there is one resource associated to company one that was only included in one legitimate company. So that means that company one has one 0% fraudulent resource. On the other hand, company one has two 50% fraudulent resources. Why? Because each of these resources are associated to one other legitimate and one fraudulent company. If we look to company two, we can see that company two has also one 0% fraudulent resource because that resource is only associated to one other legitimate company. Company two has also one 50% fraudulent resource. Why? Because that resource is associated to one other legitimate and one fraudulent company. But then there is one resource that is 100% fraudulent because it was always related to fraud before. So based on this bipartite network, I can say that if I have to guess which company has the highest probability of being, being fraudulent, I would guess company two because it has one resource with a high chance on fraud. So, when you represented the network and you have a good uh, uh, representation of your network, which reflects the reality as good as possible, can we, do, uh, can we include this network uh, knowledge into fraud detection tools and will it be helpful? Well, we first have to do some tests. And let's go back to sociology. And in sociology there is a concept which is called homophily. And homophily means that people tend to connect to other people um, which are similar to themselves. And similar in terms of uh, the same demographics or the same hobbies or the same interests. Now, there is a high chance that when you know a person and that person has bought some product, that you're also going to buy that product. Why? Because that person is influencing you. Now, if we can um, use the same reasoning in fraud networks, then we can say that if you are related to fraudulent people, it means that there is a high probability that you will also be fraudulent. So we should ask ourselves the, uh, we should ask ourselves the question, is in the fraud network, or are in the fraud network, people that are fraudulent, are they more likely to connect to other fraudulent people? And, at the same time, legitimate people, are they more likely to connect to other legitimate people? And this is a very nice picture of a homophilic network. So red nodes are the fraudulent companies, so we are going back to the uh, company uh, example. Red nodes are the companies, are the fraudulent companies, and green nodes are legitimate companies. And this uh, uh, picture illustrates that fraud is clustering together. So the red nodes are clustering together and the green nodes are clustering together. And when a network contains such patterns, we can use the social network knowledge in fraud detection tools and it can be useful. If you don't have homophilic patterns, there is a low probability that uh, network knowledge can help in improving fraud detection techniques. So given that we have a network that is homophilic and has evidence of um, fraud clustering together, we can extract features. As I already said, if we have to extract features of the whole network, it will be difficult because Networks are large and it's not scalable to extract one feature based on the whole network. So that's why I suggest to focus on the first order neighborhood. And the first order neighborhood is also called the ego net. And in an ego net, we have the ego, 
the node of interest, and he is surrounded by its direct associates, and these are called the elders. Now, based on the ego net of each company, we can extract features. We can extract ego net generic features and elder specific features. What are ego net generic features? For example, the degree. How many fraudulent resources are associated to that company? Or the relative degree. How many fraudulent resources are associated to that company compared to the total number of, com of resources? Triangles. Is there a relationship between resources? For example, when two resources were assigned uh, previously to the same company. How many triangles does the EgoNet has? Or what is the weight of the triangle? And the weight represents, is, uh, are two resources associated to one company before? Or were they associated to five companies before? On the other hand, we can include elder specific features. For example, the similarity. How similar are the elders to the ego? Or a fraud score. Is an elder uh, many times involved in fraud cases or not? A weighted fraud score, because elders who were involved in five fraud cases are much more important than elders who were involved in only one fraud case. So these are first order neighborhood features. Can we include um, influences of the whole network in our models? Well, this is called propagation of fraudulent influences through the network. So what we actually want is, based on the network, do we know which company has the highest probability of being fraudulent? So for example, if the uh, previous model, if the uh, uh, traditional fraud detection model outputs a list of companies, of high, uh, high potential companies, can we rank this list such that the company with the highest, prob uh, with the highest probability of being front will be listed um, at the top? So actually, can we construct something similar to Google so that we can give the list of fraudulent companies to Google and we ask Google, please rank it and the top company is the company which has the highest probability of being fraudulent. Is that possible? Yes, this is fraud propagation through the network. So suppose we have a network of companies and resources, like this. And the uh, companies, the green companies are legitimate companies, red companies are fraudulent companies. And the diamonds, the orange colored uh, nodes are the resources. Suppose we have two fraudulent companies. They will propagate their fraudulent influences to their resources, like this. These resources absorb these fraudulent influences and they get a shading between bright green, meaning legitimate, and bright red, meaning fraudulent. Now, some resources only get an input of one fraudulent company. Others get an input, um, a fraudulent input, of multiple fraudulent companies. And other uh, resources do not have any input of fraudulent uh, influences. Now, after absorption of this fraud by the resources, the resources are going to propagate this fraud uh, on their turn. That means this fraud will go towards all the companies they are associated to. And by this, we can rank companies. We can tell companies who get a lot of fraudulent influences also have a high probability of being fraudulent themselves. So, this is the theoretical part. Does it work in practice? Well, I want to introduce you to the social security institution of the Belgian government. And they have a very interesting case. Um, what is the Belgian social security institution doing? Well, they have uh, two responsibilities. First, they collect social contributions of companies. And second, they distribute these contributions to the appropriate fundings. For example, unemployment funding, or health insurance and so on. 
Now, especially the part where companies have to contribute to the government is very sensitive to fraud. So this was the goal at the Social Security Institution. They want to identify which companies will be fraudulent in the next period. Now, given that there are 250,000 active companies in Belgium, and we know that approximately 20 companies will be fraudulent in the next period, it's a far from obvious task to identify these 20. So, can we use network analytics was the first question. And um, actually the experts of the social security um, gave us a clue because they said they expect that there exists some fraud and structure, what they called spider constructions. What is a spider construction? A spider construction looks like a web of a spider. And this is the initial situation. So it starts with the key company. That's the black node, the middle node in the web of the spider, in the spider construction. And that key company, that is the brain of the front. And that key company is surrounded by side companies. These side companies are the actors of the fraud. So the key company will never be linked to any fraudulent activities. Why not? Because there is an implicit link between the side companies and the key companies. And it's only the side companies who actually perform these fraudulent activities. Now at a certain, uh, at a certain time, that side company does not pay its uh, social contributions to the government. That side company is bankrupt, so it quits its activities, and all its resources go to other side companies. To other side companies or maybe to a newly founded company, a newly founded side company. Or maybe some of these resources are also going to companies who are actually innocent and who don't know anything about fraudulent activities. But anyway, there is an explicit link between side companies in terms of resources. And these expectations of the experts, is this really, can we really um, uh, confirm this in the network? Well, yes, this is an example of a spiral construction. And it's very um, noticeable that, there, uh, that the uh, fraudulent companies are densely connected to each other, while the legitimate companies are just rarely uh, connected with each other. Now this is a far evolved spider construction and this is easy to uh, observe in the network. This is another example of a spider construction. And in this case it's very difficult to see that it's a spider construction. Can we uh, make this uh, representation better? Yes, remember that we can include additional objects, that we can go from a unipartite to a bipartite network, that we need to have a good representation to visualize if there is evidence of a spider construction. Well, and in this case, including resources pays off. Um, why? Well, because here it's, um, it's shown that fraudulent company one shares a lot of resources with yet legitimate company two. So based on this figure, I guess that company two will be the next company that is fraudulent in this spider construction. So, how did we include this um, knowledge? For each timestamp and for each time window, we focused on the direct neighborhood of each company. And that means that we uh, extracted features like the degree of fraudulent resources and like the maximum and average weight of the fraudulent resources, the fraudulent triangles and the weight of these triangles. And it turns out that network models always outperform non-network models. And this in three ways. First of all, in terms of accuracy. 
network models can better distinguish between fraud and non-fraud. Um, precision. The network models output a very small list, while the non-network models output a very large list. So network models are able to reduce the list to only those companies who have a high probability of being fraudulent. And last characteristic, a high recall, meaning that network models are able to identify more fraudulent companies than non-network models. And this is illustrated in the two graphs on the slide. Now, we have a list, but we still don't know which company to investigate first. Can we use propagation of fraud to um, assign a fraud score to each company? Yes, of course. So this is the same figure. We have companies and uh, resources. Companies will uh, propagate their fraudulent influence to their resources, and the resources will propagate their fraudulent influences to the companies. When I have to make a guess, I would say, well, company two, that has the highest probability of being fraudulent in the next period. If I have to make a second guess, it would be one of these two, because they, have both, they both have two fraudulent influences of resources. What is even more special is that propagation of fraud can anticipate fraudulent activities. So let's look at this company, company one. At first sight, this company is perfectly legitimate. He has resources that were never assigned before to other companies, and if they were assigned to companies, all of these companies were legitimate. Now, if we include further network effects, we can see that this company is actually part of a spiral construction. But the spiral construction is not far evolved yet. So the fraud still has to propagate towards that company. Well, using this propagation algorithm, we are able to identify company one even before it has direct associates to fraudulent companies. Okay, so this ends my presentation. Um, I want to conclude by saying that fraud indeed is an uncommon phenomenon, but when we include social network analytics, it can improve traditional fraud detection techniques in terms of accuracy, precision and recall. How can we include social network effects? Well, we can focus on the direct neighborhood and that allow us, allows us to identify uh, features like the degree, the triangles and the fraud weight. But we can also focus on the whole network, on fraud propagation. And in that uh, way, we can, um, we can assign a fraud score to every company and to every resource. And what is even better, we can anticipate fraud using these propagation algorithms. So thank you for um, uh, watching and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you, ha if you have any questions, you can always contact me uh, on the following email address.